Hey, what's up, class? Uh, welcome to week two of Comp 2. I've uh, been checking out a lot of your um, analysis, and uh, there's been some pretty good stuff in there, some pretty good thoughts and processes. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to touch base on uh, concerning Telecomus. This um, poem here that we did by Ocean Young, um, as I was kind of going through and and grading and looking at some of what you guys did, what you guys and girls did. Um, I noticed that there was a lot of you who were reading the poem literally. And so, you know, a lot of you thought it was about war or, you know, when it talked about, you know, a bullet hole in the back, you thought he'd been shot. Listen, um, think about, uh, think of a poem and every line of a poem, think of it uh, like a suitcase. And so the line itself is a suitcase. But in order to really understand the deeper meaning, you have to sit and unzip and unpack the line. So um, when you analyze a poem, a shot in the back is never a really an actual literal shot in the back. A river is never just a river. You know, a road trip is never just a road trip, right? These are all vehicles. These are all metaphors, figurative language to express some deeper meaning. So when you're analyzing, you're not just telling me what that line means in the sense of like, you know, the one I saw a lot was a lot of you said with a bullet hole in his back, a lot of you said he'd been shot in the back. No, I mean, there's deeper things happening there, right? And so um, I wanted to kind of go over this with you guys uh, real briefly. And what I'd like you to do is take notes on this brief lecture over Ocean Young. And I'm going to have you uh, submit these notes this week for um, the assignment this week. So uh, real quickly, I want you to pull up the poem, Telecomus by Ocean Vyong, the one that we just submitted. And I want you to look at it while I'm sort of speaking here. And so uh, if you looked uh, looked it up, if you spent some time doing some research, you know that Telecomus uh, is a character in the famous uh, book, The Odyssey. Um, and Telecomus was always looking for his father, who was Odysseus. Um, Odysseus was known kind of as the wandering father. And so just a little bit of research on the name gives us a lot of insight into what's going on, right? So we're going to read it really quickly, and then we're going to kind of quickly go line by line. It says, like any good son, I pull my father out of the water and drag him by his hair through the white sand, his knuckles carving a trail the waves rush in to erase because the city beyond the shore is no longer where we left it because the bombed cathedral is now a cathedral of trees. I kneel beside him to show how far I might sink. Do you know who I am, Bah? But the answer never comes. The answer is the bullet hole in his back brimming with seawater, and he is so still I think he could be anyone's father. Found the way a green bottle might appear at a boy's feet containing a year he has never touched. A touch his ears, no use. I turn him over to face it the cathedral in his sea black eyes, the face not mine, but one I will wear to kiss all my lovers good night, the way I seal my father's lips with my own and begin the faithful work of drowning. So the immediate vibe we get from this reading is there's something going on between the narrator and the father, right? Um, a lot of you had a different, a lot of different ideas about um, what was going on, you know, um, and so and that's fine. I just be really careful when you have a thought, when you're developing an argument, which when you're t analyzing and when you're giving me an interpretation, that's your argument. You're arguing that the poem means this. Make sure you are supporting that claim with other facts. You can't just tell me, oh, I think the poem is this and not give me any reasons why you have to support it. So, you know, like any good son, I pull my father out of the water, dragging by his hair. 
Um, I think this connotates, this is absence. Where has his father been? What does, this, what does the water represent? Why is the son in a place, the narrator in a place to be dragging his father out of this water? Well, we think about the sea, we think about water, it's vast, it's big, it's deep, it's scary, it's dark, it's cold, you know. And so uh, we think about things washing up ashore. We think about, uh, you know, all the way a beach might look, the way, you know, rocks and, and, and dirt and debris washes up ashore. And so I think this first collection of lines is about the sudden return of somebody who has been absent. And it's interesting that the narrator talks about pulling his father out of the water and dragging him by his hair. There's this there that's a violent imagery, right? That's not, you know, that's not pleasant imagery to be pulled by your hair, to have your hair pulled is very painful. It's very violent. It's very, there's no sense of closeness here. There's no sense of um, generosity of spirit. There's, it's very, it's angry, you know? So I think in some ways there's been this absence of the father and he sort of washes back into the son's life, not, through an ocean. This is a metaphor. The ocean and the water is all a metaphor for sort of time and arriving back after a long time away, you know, and this whole idea of dragging the father out of the water is sort of this idea of violence, of this encounter. Father's been away and this encounter isn't pleasant. It's not smooth or seamless. There's anger. There's issues here says that his knuckles, dragging by his hair through the white sand, his knuckles carving a trail, the waves rush into a race. So the father is back and everything he has ever touched is sort of forgotten. His impact on the narrator's life is brief in the same way that when we step in the sand and the water quick, quickly comes in and washes it away, I think the narrator is saying, that the father has had no real lasting impact on the son, that everything he has done was quickly washed away by time. And it says, because the city beyond the shore is no longer where we left it. There's a sense of we here, the city, a place where we exist, a time, uh, a way that we existed. I think the narrator here is saying like what once was is no longer that city, the vibrancy of a, that city of that time is no longer it says because the bombed cathedral is now a cathedral of trees in the same way that we all have been betrayed by a significant other, by a husband, a wife, a friend, a family member. You know, we think about the ideas of cathedral. It's a place of faith, right? Uh, it's a place where a God is worshipped, a place where there's collective worship, uh, and it's faith, right? But when we are betrayed, then that faith is destroyed. So this cathedral represents this kind of faith in his father. It represents this goodness and this light that has been destroyed, but it's a cathedral of trees, so there's some hope there, right? Like, even though this cathedral was destroyed, even though you hurt me, even though you caused me a lot of pain, uh, I was able, able to overcome. It took time, you know. So we look at this cathedral, the bombed cathedral, over time, over a long time, eventually is overrun by nature and beauty again. So I think he's saying is, you hurt me. Dad, your absence hurt me, but it's been a long time. And over time, uh, I've healed. I've, I'm okay. I kneel beside him to show how far I might sink. I think this is the first time we're seeing any kind of closeness here, right? And we're seeing, literally speaking, I kneel beside him. I get closer to him, but then there's this sinking. So it's almost like proximity hurts, 
right? Going back to our former analogy about being betrayed by somebody, somebody betrays us, hurts our trust, it breaks us, but we eventually heal. But sometimes proximity to that person reminds us of that betrayal and it hurts all the same. It hurts all over again. I think that sinking feeling is what he's talking about. He's basically saying the closer I get to you, the more pain I feel. And he says, do you know who I am? But the answer never comes. There's almost like this hope here, right? This is a rhetorical question. He's asking his dad, do you know who I am? And I think that's this slight moment where we see the narrator hoping, maybe this isn't my father, right? Because he doesn't, uh, there's so much pain and he doesn't recognize him. The father's not responding in any way that exhibits any sort of recognition, which shows us this, this absence has been a lifetime in the sense of the father doesn't recognize the son at all. So much so the son's like, maybe you aren't, or maybe you aren't my father. It's, and it's almost this rhetorical question of hope, you know, because there's so much pain that there's, he's trying to find some way to excuse, to, 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 to uh, explain the pain. The answer never comes. The answer is the bullet hole in his back, brimming with seawater. I saw a lot of you get caught up on this part saying that he'd been shot in the back or that he was, the father was injured and that the son, you know, pulled them, him out of the water because he'd been shot. But we're all talking in metaphors here. We're trying to pull away the layers here. So, so far we see that there's been a great deal of absence. The father and the son, the father doesn't recognize the son. The son in some ways doesn't recognize the father, Right. That bullet hole, this is a wound, right? This is the narrator and his perception of his dad. His dad doesn't recognize him. And in some ways, there's, you know, the son doesn't recognize the father. The father is not the same man he once was. And so while you might look at that, there's a bullet wound in his back brimming with seawater and think he's been shot. I think really it's just the son looking at the father going, you aren't the man I once knew. You are wounded. You are broken, right? Wounded, not physically necessarily, but phys you know, mentally wounded, emotionally wounded, spiritually even wounded. Like the son is looking at the father and going, you know, you are not the same man. I do think there is something there about the back. You know, I think, you know, we think about being stabbed in the back or somebody turning their back. And so um, the father turned his back on the son. And so the son's looking at the back right now. And that's what we're looking at, right? Brimming with seawater. Well, we know that the absence is being used as a metaphor for distance and time, uh, or rather water is being used as a metaphor for absence and distance and time. And I think I think he, he what what the narrator is saying is you are wounded uh, I don't recognize you and your wounds um, and your whole body is full of of these foreign things I don't recognize like you are dripping with wherever it is you've been like you don't look like home you're not recognizable you look like something else altogether and you're full of whatever that is you know. Um, he is so still, I think he could be anyone's father. Again, there's this sense of hope there. Maybe he's not my dad. This is his way of trying to understand his own pain, understand the absence. This is our nature, right? Like when somebody hurts us and we love them and we care for them, we go through this process of trying to make excuses, you know, for that person, we, for that situation you know, and I think here the narrator is looking at this man going, there's got to be some reason why this man doesn't look like my father and he doesn't recognize me and he's been gone so long. Like, And so I think what we're looking at is the inner monologue here of, you know, maybe, you know, you could be anybody's dad. Maybe you're not 
mine. You know, I don't recognize you. I don't recognize you. And he said that he's so still, I think he could be anyone's father. Found the way a green bottle might appear at a boy's feet containing a year he has never touched. When I think about a bottle being thrown in the ocean and it just sort of washes up without any schedule or any, um, it, it's sort of almost happenstance, right? We come upon a bottle with a message in it um, or something in it, like it's just, it, it washes up when it wants to, it has a mind of its own. Um, and we may or may not find it and may, it's like, feels like fate, like luck, right? Out of all the people it could have found, it found me. Here it is, like, you know, um, and so this is a tricky couple of lines, right? We have to take it all in stride. So far, we're talking about absence. We're talking about an absence so severe that it's created uh, two unrecognizable or two people who are unrecognizable to each other. It, 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 this absence has created um, this pain, right? And so when we look at this green bottle, we think about what that might mean, or a little thing out and see lost, and then all of a sudden it's found, but not really found. Um, I also think of um, how unexpected that might be to discover the green bottle washed out to see how unexpected to find something like that um, on the beach, almost like grief. Grief sometimes can just unexpectedly come and, and cause a great deal of pain and feel like drowning, right? Um, so I think there's this whole idea of the green bottle appearing at a boy's feet containing a year he has never touched. I think that's just a metaphor for something unfamiliar, you know. So this whole situation is unexpected and unfamiliar. I touch his ears, no use. I turn him over, you know. So the ears being touched, there's some sort of, do you recognize, like, my voice? Do you understand here? Do you hear me, Father? And the Father doesn't. There's still no recognition here. I turn him over to face it. Really interesting choice of words here. So far, the Father's been on on on, on his face, right? And so I think, and we're just seeing the back, and the back had the bullet hole, and the, the man's, the narrator's looking at the back, and I think this is a metaphor for the Father turning his back on the narrator. Um, he's turning him over, he's speaking to him, but the Father does not recognize the boy's voice because of that absence. And he calls him an it. There's such a disconnect there, right? It's not dad. It's not boss. Not father. It's an it's an it, right? And he talks about this cathedral. And this is the first time we're really returning to a certain piece of imagery. Uh, but this time, the cathedral isn't busted or broken. There's no negative connotation. Um, I turn to face it, this unrecognizable man, the cathedral, in his sea black eyes. So there's this certain beauty there. There's, even though, you know, that the sea black almost gives this idea of like being unrecognizable, right? Uh, his eyes are unrecognizable. In some ways, this man is unrecognizable, but he still sees this cathedral. So he still has this faith. He still has this beauty. I think this is where you're seeing tension here. The wrestling between a boy and his dad. And he, the boy is acknowledging, dad, you've caused me pain. You're unrecognizable. You don't even recognize me. But still, when I look at you, I see something. I still feel something. I still see beauty in that you are my father and you will always be my father, regardless of how much you've hurt me, regardless of how distant and absent you've been. So the cathedral and the sea black eyes, the boy here, is wrestling with the fact that he feels still love for his father. The face is not mine, he says, but one I will wear to kiss all my lovers good night. I think the face is not mine is saying I'm, you know, but one day it will be is, you know, he's talking about one day I will grow into this face. When I'm older I will look like this. And guess what look what he says here. It'll be the one I wear to kiss all my lovers goodnight. So that's plural. It's lovers, not one. Because if it was just one lover, that's kind of romantic, right? That kind of gives us this vibe of 
romance and marriage and oneness and you know and so it's a whole different poem if he says the face all were to kiss my lover good night but he says lovers that's plural that's multiple right doesn't we don't know how many so i think not only is he is the narrator saying that's not my face but one day it'll be the face i wear i think the narrator's admitting that one day he could become his father this is the first glimpse we have that where a father might have been. Maybe his father ran off, you know, to live a life of promiscuity and just sleeping around and living that life of a single man. And and, and in some way, the narrator is saying, I too, one day will become you. One day I will be absent. One day I will spend all of my time with all of my lovers. He says, the way I seal my father's lips with my own and begin the faithful work of drowning. Kind of confusing. Seal his lips, his father's lips with his own. Some of you said um, this was a kiss, but I think it's more about something being spoken. I think it's more about uh, this absence, um, almost like being forgiven. There's this sense of like, You've been gone. Um, you've caused me a great deal of pain. You're still my father. And the reality is I'm probably going to end up being you. I'm probably going to end up living the same kind of life as you. So in some way, there's some. There, he's relating a little bit there. Um, and then it talks about the faithful work of drowning. I think, you know, faithful means to, that something will come to pass, right? Drowning is this death. And so I think... The end of the poem gives us this idea like that all of this pain, all of this absence is being put to death. And, and he's coming to this understanding of who his father is. He's, he's coming to terms with the humanity of his father. That doesn't mean that he's not going to feel pain or feel the absence. But I think his idea of his father is being put to death as he realizes that the older he gets, the narrator, he is too is becoming just like his father. So there's this sense of understanding there. And so um, some of the things I want you to take away here is to listen specifically how I broke down each line, how I was unpacking it, and how I was building. Essentially, you're creating building blocks uh, with each line, and you're building up your interpretation, right? And so... Um, it's not just a, you're not just saying one thing on one line and then moving a different direction with the other. Like you're building an interpretation and you want to make sure you're able to argue why that interpretation is a valid interpretation. So um, hopefully you took notes on this uh, half a page roughly. That's going to be one of your assignments this week. Take half a page notes on this as it relates to how you interpreted the poem and some things you can do better next time. Um, and then I'm going to have you do another poem this week as well. So I appreciate the work you guys are doing so far. Great week one. And um, if you need anything at all, please feel free to reach out. All right.